Someone asked a question the other day about the perception of inconstancy on the Chang. She was saying that many of her friends talked about how it was a very comforting contemplation, and she didn't find any comfort in it at all. And that's the whole point. It's not supposed to be comforting. But it is meant to bring you to your senses. All fabrications are inconstant. Notice that's not all things are inconstant. After all, Nibbana is constant, it's said to be permanent. Although actually it lies outside of space and time. So permanent is not quite the word, but it doesn't change. But everything else that the mind encounters goes through the process of fabrication. Everything you see, hear, smell, taste, touch, think about has to be processed. In the course of processing, you make it inconstant. So if things were just left there, you wouldn't really know what to do, because there's so many ways that you can take that insight. But the Buddha says, take it in the context of the Four Noble Truths. That will assign a duty to whatever comes up. You encounter any clinging, okay, you realize that has to be comprehended. Because you're going to be clinging to things that change, and when you cling to things that change, you want them to be a certain way, and then they change into something else. There's going to be suffering. So you want to comprehend that, that that's where the suffering lies. It's not so much in the fact that things change. The suffering lies in the fact that you're clinging. You try to figure out why you're clinging, you come across some craving. That's to be abandoned. That's something you simply let go. And you don't want to wait until it goes away on its own. You do what you can to make sure it doesn't come back. Or if it does come back, let go as fast as you can. As for the cessation of suffering, that's something to be realized. And then the path. Even though the factors of the path are made out of fabrications, you have to develop them. Because those are fabrications that can get you out. So not simply that you say, well, everything's inconstant, just leave it at that. You try to figure out, well, what's inconstant in what way, and what has what potentials. This connects with the Buddhist teaching on what's called dhatu, element or potential. These are potentials that lie latent in the physical universe and in your mind. And they show themselves clearly when they get provoked. Some of the things are neutral, like there's the, the datu of consciousness. Some things in the mind are actually unskillful. There's the datu of sensuality. In other words, there's potential in the mind just lying there waiting for something to provoke it. Although, as John Lee noted many times, it doesn't wait. It goes out looking for things to provoke it. But then there are good potentials in the mind as well. There's a potential for mindfulness, a potential for concentration, for discernment. And so you don't just wait for these things to come and go. You actively search out which are the skillful things, which are the unskillful ones. Like right now, as you're meditating, there's a potential in the breath for there to be a sense of ease, a sense of fullness. 
It's there someplace in the body. And you have to know how to provoke it, to bring it out. And the question is, how do you relate to the body in such a way that, how do you relate to the breath in such a way that you can actually bring this out? You have to look at the way you breathe. Now, the problem is that you're used to your way of breathing, and it's hard to think that maybe there might be other ways of breathing. This is why it's useful to listen to what John Lee has to say about the breath, about the various ways it can flow in the body, to give you an idea. But even then, you're just reading the words. You've got to figure out, well, what is he talking about in terms of how you relate to your breath? Do you squeeze the breath out as you breathe out? If you do, you're getting in the way of the potential for a sense of fullness and ease. Do you try to mark the distinction between the in-breath and the out-breath very clearly? Again, you're getting in the way, because the markers tend to be tense. You don't really need the mark. You can think of the breath as being a cycle. It has four stages in the cycle. There's the in-breath, and then there's the space between the in-breath and the out-breath, and then there's the out-breath, and then there's the space between the out-breath and the in-breath. And it goes around and around. You don't want there to be a clear marker among them. Just notice they shade into one another. And allowing them to shade into one another allows that sense of fullness to begin to develop. So there are potentials here. You're not here just watching what is already here. Trying to make the most of the potentials. And when you do that, then you're approaching inconsistency in the right way. Because otherwise nothing develops. And we do want to develop the path. We want to learn how to delight in developing the path, delight in abandoning the craving. knowing which potentials need to be encouraged and which ones should not. This is the role of mindfulness as a governing principle. It doesn't just watch things coming and going. If it notices that something is skillful, it encourages it to come, and then tries to keep it from going. So when they talk about accepting the present moment, I don't think it means simply accepting whatever comes up and going with whatever comes up. You want to bring some skill to this. And the skill lies in knowing where the potentials are for the different factors of the path, and how you can provoke them, in other words, bring them into being, and how you can keep them in being. I mean, they will eventually fall away. It's like that raft across the river. Eventually it will fall apart. But you try to put it together as well as you can so that it doesn't fall apart in the middle of the stream. If it falls apart after you've gotten to the other side, there's no problem. You're already on the other side, and that's what the whole purpose was. The purpose in have, having a raft. So when you're dealing with inconstant things, you're dealing with change. Try to be very clear. You don't want to just label everything changes, everything isn't constant. I think that you've attained wisdom of some kind. I know a monk who had been in the forest tradition for several years, went back home to his family, and his brother asked him, well, what did you learn being a monk over there? What's, the, what's this teaching of the Buddha? And the monk said, well, everything isn't constant, or he's probably said impermanent. And the brother said, duh, everybody knows that. The important thing is, when you encounter something in constant, what do you do with it? And the doing is the important thing. You're not just sitting here as a witness of what's coming and going. Comprehending suffering, for instance, doesn't mean simply realizing, oh yes, there is suffering. Comprehending it means looking in to see, well, what are you doing to contribute to it? And as I was saying the other day, this doesn't mean simply accepting the fact that it's there and not wanting it to change. 
because the line between the mental contribution, say, to a physical pain and the physical contribution of the physical pain is not all that clear. Every time there's a feeling, there's always going to be a perception. I think it's a passage in the canon which General Sari Bhutta is talking. He says, feeling, perception, fabrication, these things are hard to tease out. They come together. And the way to tease them out is to figure out, well, how can I be, say, with pain but not suffer from it? How can I learn how to be patient with it? with the minimum amount of suffering. That means seeing how you can change the physical elements and go into the pain. In other words, the way you breathe, how you relate to the warmth in the body, the solidity in the body, the liquid sensations in the body, and then your perceptions around the pain itself. This is your mental contribution. So you keep experimenting, changing this, changing that, see what has an effect. Because this is how you learn about cause and effect, anyhow. You've got to manipulate what seem to be the causes and to figure out which ones are the real causes. So you want to suffer as little as possible. Ideally, you'd like the pain to go away. But it's also good if you learn how to be with the pain but not suffer from it. And knowing where the line is, where you can see how things separate out, that's going to come from experimenting. So again, there are potentials here, some of which you've aggravated without realizing it. So you want to be more conscious about how you approach the sensations that are coming up in the body, sensations coming up in the mind. knowing that they are inconstant, and asking yourself, what's the best thing I can do with these things? And the Buddha's right there with the Four Noble Truths and the duties appropriate to them. So try to bring that framework to bear. And when you look at things as being inconstant in that framework, then you can get the best use out of them.